Hello and welcome. Today's video is an overview of my solar panels output from my travel trailer. I'm going to be going over the Victron monitoring portal showing you the cumulative energy that was produced throughout the course of 2022, as well as briefly the consumption numbers that went into two main sources, which was my Tesla and my HVAC system, which is the heat pump mini split. So let's get into the data. Something that I think is worth mentioning is this right here is a graph of the year over year power production from the solar panels on the roof of my house. So this is not the RV. But what I'm wanting to point out is if you look over here at January, this green uh, bar is 2023 in January, and this light blue bar is January of 2022, which is the year that we're looking at for these uh, solar panels on my RV. But look at the variation of the production. It's significant, right? 1.1 megawatt hours in 2022 versus 0.5, so half that. Uh, so just know that there is a lot of variance from year to year with solar, and you can see that here clearly on this graph throughout all these other years. Now you'll see there is a step change difference, and that is in 2019. So the purple graph here, the purple bars rather, you'll see right here I installed an additional third of my solar array. Maybe ignore these lower ones and just look at these taller ones compared to each other, and you'll see that there is some variance there, and for some reason the Januaries of these last two years were pretty significantly different. And so what you're seeing is higher in January for that RV, and maybe other variances throughout the years as well. So th that's something that's expected with solar, but I just wanted to point out how significant that can be sometimes. This is the Victron monitoring portal, and it's connected to the uh, Serbo GX in my trailer through Wi-Fi. And you can see right here, it's showing real time. So it is actually connected to the trailer in real time, giving us that real time information, which this right now happens to be what the trailer is producing. Now one thing to understand here is that the PV charger here, this is the solar panels, this is 2,650 watts of solar panels on the roof of the trailer. So right now it's actually producing pretty good. We're on, uh, you know, sunny and outside it is currently 33 degrees and it's uh, March 2nd. So give you an idea of the, the angle of the sun there. Over here on the battery, this is a 9.6 kilowatt hour battery bank. Right now, you can, with 70%, that's roughly 7 kilowatt hours of energy that is stored there. But we're not interested in that. We're actually looking down here at the historical data section. Now, one important distinction is that where my travel trailer is parked on the side of my house, late in the afternoon, there is a shadow cast from the roof of the house onto those solar panels that you know proceeds to increase throughout the afternoon. It, it, it depends on when in the afternoon and the time of the year when that shade starts to be cast, but there is a cumulative effect there that over the course of the year, I have lost out on some energy, I don't know how much, that's something to be aware of when you're looking at these numbers, that it could be even higher still based on these solar panels if there was zero shading on a regular basis especially. As a point of reference, you can see here that on November 16th, the solar panels were just starting to get shaded at 1.37 p.m., which is pretty early in the afternoon, but during the most of the summer, it's actually way later than that. So I'm going to zoom in here on this so that we can see this better. I guess first I should point out that the dates that we're looking at is from January 1st through January 1st of 2022 to 2023. So this is all of the solar production of all of 2022. Also, I do have the memory card installed in the Servo GX. So if we're out on a trip and we don't have any data connection, it is still logging this data. And then the next time it connects to Wi-Fi, it uploads it all. So there is no lost data throughout the year. And then over here on the right side, we have two AC input. I've never done that. I don't have the trailer set up to be able to send two AC input. So that's not relevant for my setup. From AC input is relevant. I can plug in my trailer to shore power. And as you can see for the entire year, I only did that for 47 kilowatt hours worth of charging. And that was all at the beginning of the year when the system was new and I was testing it and I had it plugged into a generator and into my house as I was testing that uh, functionality. However, since um, probably sometime in February, I never plugged it into a generator again, and it's been solely powered from solar panels. And as you can see, those solar panels produced 3,170 kilowatt hours, which is a fantastic amount of energy. I'm very happy about that. And it's more than enough energy for what the trailer needs. Now, just so you know, everything on my trailer uses electricity. I replaced all the propane components to be electrically powered. We don't even carry propane on the trailer anymore. If you're interested in seeing a video about all those modifications I made, I'll put a card above that you can click on to go see uh, all of those modifications. But just so you know, this uh, electricity that we're using and that we are uh, producing, it, it's sized for a trailer that's fully using electricity. 
Now, just to give you an idea of the monetary value of the amount of electricity my trailer produced in a year, if we uh, take the 3,170 kilowatt hours produced and we multiply that by the utility rate in your area, in mine in the past, it was about 10.9 cents on average. It's kind of complicated because it's a block system. In any case, your, take your utility rate and multiply that by the kilowatt hours. And for me, it was about $345 worth of electricity. It has actually gone up more recently. So this would probably be a little bit more, but that gives you a ballpark figure for the monetary value. In a future video, I'll go over the costs of what it costs to install all of these components into my trailer. And then we'll talk about the break even period on that. If you're interested in watching that video, then feel free to subscribe and you'll get notified automatically when I post that video. And then here on the consumption side, you can see that I've used 2,523 kilowatt hours. Now that's obviously less than the solar produced. And I believe the difference there is um, efficiency losses, uh, energy going in and out of a battery. It's not 100% efficient. Same thing with solar energy coming in in, going through the charge controllers, going into the battery, back out through the inverter, all of those are losses. And so the actual consumption that I've consumed from the inverters at that point to the point of consumption is, um, is that much. So that's my overview on the system. Let's go over the graph here on the left side. You can see there's a legend. So the, the red uh, bars on the graph are the consumption. The yellow is the solar production coming in, in, and then the battery's charge state, I guess, and in this case we're averaging because it's over a large period of time, is the blue dot, which is this line across the middle. There's one other thing that's not shown in that legend, and if I mouse over this, you'll see it shows the battery's minimum and maximum. That's a lighter blue shaded area. And so for that month, you can see in January, for instance, it got as low as 1% and as high as 100% throughout the course of that entire month. And that's the case for all of this. So. Let's look at this graph a little bit more from month to month. Now, something to understand here is the, the energy consumption here that is being displayed is primarily actually charging my Tesla Model S, which I'll be making a separate video about next. There is a secondary consumption, and that is the, the heat pump mini split for a heating or cooling inside of the trailer. Now, I didn't use that for the shoulder seasons, like in the spring and in the fall. But in the height of the summer, when it got really hot, I would use the air conditioning of the mini split to cool the trailer so that the batteries would not get too hot. And I'll be making a separate video about that uh, mini split and how I use that and the dynamics of that throughout the year. Keeping that in mind, that's the important, that's what's the loads in here and that's the consumption. Obviously when we're camping and using the trailer, then the loads are the trailer and what we're using on board while we're living in the trailer while we're camping. Looking here at January, the uh, solar production was you know, not fantastic compared to say June, but it's, it's something. And I also would push the snow off the solar panels so that they would pre be producing as much as possible throughout the year, anytime there was snow in you know, the beginning of the year and in the end of the year. And I made a video about that, which I'll put a card above. Now, keep in mind that this average here is higher in the winter because sometimes I would need to use the electricity, as I just mentioned, for heating the trailer to keep the batteries a little bit warm. And so I knew I'd potentially need some of that energy, plus the days are short. And so I know there's a lot of room there on a margin on the top of the battery where it won't charge really quickly. And my main goal is I don't want the batteries to ever get full because then the solar production just completely stops producing. This is a spreadsheet I built that encapsulates the combination of the RV solar output plus the loads from the Tesla, as well as the mini split and just my data of my experimentation throughout the year. I'll get into this in more detail in a little bit. I wanted to point out this column though, because this is related to what I'm just talking about. I have an indication of whether or not the RV battery achieved 100% in that day. Uh, the vast majority of these yeses are very brief. Sometimes we were just away from the house and the uh, mini split couldn't pull down the energy fast enough. And so as soon as we got home, I plugged in the Tesla and pulled it down. And, and so there are a total of 64 of these yeses throughout the year. And the vast majority of those, we only lost out on a little bit of energy. Here in the winter, I would let the batteries stay at a higher percentage. And then as the season progressed and we went through the spring, I would slowly discharge the, the battery more. And remember, this is an average for the entire month. Um, so days varied quite a bit depending on the weather and whatnot, but generally I would keep the battery in a middle state of charge. That's healthier for the battery, right? And then when we get down here into the June, you know, May, June, July period, and I guess that went all the way through September, the days are long, the solar production is high, and I did not want the batteries to fill up, but there were times when we'd go driving the car somewhere, and so I couldn't be sending all the energy there. And so I wanted to give myself a larger buffer between now and when the battery is full. So I just keep the battery fairly discharged. 
and sometimes I would be discharging it throughout the day or other times I would come home late in the day and the battery would be full so just the next morning I would make sure to start charging the car quickly and run it down um, so that the, the day had somewhere for that energy to go. And then going into the fall and winter at the end of the year, kind of the rever uh, same as the beginning of the year where the battery percentage goes up and up and up. And you'll see that the solar ramps up and down just like normal for a full year of solar production. But you'll notice that April is actually quite a bit lower and you may be wondering about that. And that is simply because we went on a long Tesla road trip. So because we weren't home and the trailer was just parked at the house, I actually got the battery to a state of charge that I liked and then just shut off the entire system. So it couldn't be producing electricity, but I didn't want the batteries to be staying completely full while we were away. This solar production number could certainly be higher if we had had the system running in April. Now, one other thing I would mention is there were other times in the summer when we did go on road trips in our Tesla and I just left the trailer running and I would leave the air conditioning on while we were away because might, might as well use the energy for something. So there were other points in the year when the battery got full and as you can see each month pretty much the battery got full at some point but I tried to keep that to a minimum. Just to give you an idea of the variations that uh, could be possible here, if I switch over to, uh, instead of looking at from January to January, what if I look at it from February 1st to February 1st? Then you'll see that we now have slightly less solar that was produced from this 12 month rolling window. Other than that, it's, it's about the same. It's what you, know, you would expect. It's, and then if we switch and do the same thing for March, we now have about the same amount of solar production. Now let's look here in the consumption part of the historical data from the Victron monitoring portal. You'll see here that the, the same graph that we saw before roughly is, is indicated, but now we are looking at just the consumption. And in this case, really there's only two types of consumption. Uh, in here it does show from grid, and, and so that is showing the times that I charged from the grid. Uh, otherwise, this is energy that's coming from the battery or, or from solar. And so the vast majority of the time, I tried to have the Tesla charging from the trailer throughout the day during the sun so that the energy would go straight into the Tesla's battery and skip the RV battery as much as possible. Uh, there is some of this that is discharging from the battery, but the majority of it is from solar directly, and it's being consumed directly from solar. That's what this is indicating. Now in the winters, uh, winter months, that becomes less the case. Sometimes I would just, not even bother to charge the Tesla for the whole day because the solar production was so minimal and so the battery would go up and then I would just discharge it the next day or maybe even two days later, kind of dependent on the weather. But in the summer there's so much solar I just really needed to make sure that Tesla was charging pretty consistently throughout the summer. There isn't really much else to look at here because really it's just a matter of those two points of consumption uh, minus over here when I'm plugged into the grid and things are being consumed directly. Like when we're camping and have it plugged into a generator for instance, that's what this from grid would be indicating. We did that very, very minimally. So let's look over here at the solar. And so now this graph is showing us how much solar is going directly into the battery versus how much is being directly used. And this is pretty similar to the, the prior graph that we were just looking at. It's looking at the data from the other direction. It's when it's coming from the solar, where is it going versus when it's being consumed, where is it coming from? And you'll see that they are generally reflections of each other. And in this case, there really are just the two. Uh, you know, solar can only go to two places. It can be directly consumed or it can go into the battery. And that is indicated here throughout the year. And then lastly, we have grid, and this is going to be not much to talk about here. Like I said, I only used the grid for January and February, and in those months, it was directly used a little bit versus it went into the battery mostly, and that's all there is to see. I'm going to take you back now to this spreadsheet, and I'm going to go through a couple of notable entries in here just to give you an idea of some highs and lows and some uh, interesting graphs that are in here. On January 1st, I did a cold weather test where I wanted to test the worst case scenario going into the night where the battery is cold, the cabin of the trailer is cold. And so I let the battery charge up throughout the afternoon, plugged into the house actually, and I got it up to 100%. And you can see 80% of that came from the grid. And then the girls and I went out and slept in the trailer overnight. This first hour here, there was a ton of energy consumption as we were heating up the cabin and watching a movie. So the battery was at 100% and I am heating up the trailer. It gets down to 86% right now. 
And the girls are watching a movie and we're sleeping overnight in the trailer in Kanto. And uh, this is the mini split here that's heating up the trailer. Outside it's supposed to get down to about eight degrees Fahrenheit tonight. I had the mini split set to 65 degrees Fahrenheit all night long. And by the next morning, you can see this energy consumption graph uh, was having about half of a kilowatt hour consumed from it throughout the night. And the next morning, the battery was down to 11% remaining. For the last 10 days of January, I left the mini split on nearly continuously heating the cabin generally to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And as you can see, the amount of consumption varies pretty dramatically depending on the weather outside, but it's also the how much sun was shining on the trailer and warming it up that way. For the first two weeks of February, we were traveling in our trailer down to Arizona and the ambient temperatures fluctuated from around you know, less than 20 degrees Fahrenheit up here in Utah down to Arizona. It got as high as 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So this series of graphs gives you an, an idea of what it looks like when we're living in the trailer and using it on a daily basis. March 21st is the exact middle point between the winter and the summer solstice. So this 13 kilowatt hours indicated here is a good example of the average solar production you might expect throughout the year. And this was a perfectly sunny day. May 14th is an example where I discharged the RV battery into the Tesla and I got the RV down to 0% by 8.43 in the morning. And then I was away most of the day so I couldn't charge it and as this was an experiment to see how full the RV battery would get or how quickly would it get full. And I took note that at 2.30 p.m. is when the RV battery completely filled and then it, it didn't produce any more electricity for a couple of hours because it was full. And then I got home and plugged in the Tesla and then they, they, we got what little bit, bit of tail solar there was at the end of the day. May 21st is an example day where I had the Tesla charging from the RV all day doing great and then I forgot about it and the solar production dropped off into the evening and I discovered it right as the RV got down to 0% and so I hurried and stopped the Tesla charging and then the RV sat, at, I guess it got to 1% before the sun completely set and it was at 1% for the rest of the day and then of course the next day as the solar came up it ramped up and then I plugged in the Tesla the next morning once the RV battery had a little bit of charge in it. I generally try to avoid letting the RV battery get that low for that long. May 27th is when we were going to go camping and I have a video edited and it's going to be publishing in a couple of weeks. It was a series of unfortunate events that occurred. I'll obviously get into that in that video, but basically I let the RV battery get completely full because we were going to be camping in it that evening and I wanted to make sure we had plentiful energy. Well, we had some truck problems and the RV ended up getting parked on the side of the road for a couple of days. And so you can see here, it just sat there full while we were away and I didn't have time to deal with the state of charge and trying to lower it or anything like that. So that's what it was at until we got home and then I discharged it back into the Tesla. May 31st is the most electricity that was produced in a single day at 18 kilowatt hours, which is rounded up. It's technically 17.61 kilowatt hours. This is how sunny that day was according to the solar panels on the roof of our house. So you can see there were a couple of slight moments of clouds, otherwise it was quite sunny throughout the day. Now keep in mind, our storage capacity of our batteries is 9.6 kilowatt hours. So this is 183% of our storage capacity in our batteries. Now, if you're thinking that this battery size is insufficient for the solar, or maybe the solar is too big, uh, keep in mind that there's a winter solstice video that I made. I'll, I'll post a card above. But on the shortest day of the year, the battery only charged up 51% over the course of a fully sunny day on the shortest day of the year. So there is an enormous variance from the winter to the summer of the length of the day and the angle of the sun and, and thus the solar yield. And so that's why I wanted a large array so that I could build towards the worst case scenario, which is the winter time. June 13th is the day where I saw the highest solar production in June, and that was at 2,539 watts of solar production in that moment. There was a brief spike in clouds. It was actually a rainy day, but it was a cool day. It had just finished raining. The, the solar panels were wet, and then the sun came out really strong, and that's when we got that peak. June 21st was the summer solstice, and it was a perfectly sunny day. So unsurprisingly, we got 17 kilowatt hours. As you saw though, in May, I had up to 17 as well. July 15th is when I saw the all time highest solar uh, production in one moment of the entire year, and that was at 2,609 watts. That happened about 1.45 p.m., and the ambient temperature was 76 degrees Fahrenheit at the time. Similar to the other prior high, this was on an overcast and raining day, 
and then all of a sudden the sun came out and the solar production spiked. August 3rd is the day where I tried to ramp up and down the consumption from the Tesla to match the solar production of the day. Uh, in the beginning it's too low to worry about, so then I started charging the Tesla around 9 a.m. And as you can see I did a fairly good job of matching the, the consumption from the Tesla which I can adjust at 1 amp increments at 240 volts, so that's 240 watts. Also the slowest that the Tesla will charge is at this 5 amps it shows on the screen which at 240 volts is 1200 watts. As we ramped down into the evening I got off a little bit here as well because I stopped charging the Tesla mid-hour here in the 4 p.m. hour. Here on September 1st is another example day like that where this blue line that is the state of charge of the trailer battery is not quite flat but is pretty close to flat as you can get because I'm trying to match all of the solar and go have it go straight into the Tesla battery instead of the RV battery. September 19th is another example day where I wanted to experiment with how quickly the RV battery would charge throughout the day without any loads on it. So here at 8.53 in the morning I fully discharged the battery and by 4.55 p.m. it had fully charged. October 10th I left the inverter on overnight so you can see this little bit of power consumption is just the inverter. The car was not plugged in, the mini split was off. So the uh, inverter looks like it's pulling about 50 watts an hour. October 14th through 23rd we were camping in the Moab area. This is the aggregate total of all the energy across that time frame and we were down in the South Canyonlands National Park area and then the northern end we went to arches and you know Moab area. So this gives you an idea of what the power production looks like when it's not next to our house and we're living in the trailer. I'm still working on editing trips that we've done before that trip to Moab but that is something I intend to edit and get published on my channel shortly. So if you're interested in seeing those videos feel free to subscribe and you'll get notified automatically when I post those videos. November 2nd is our first snow of the year and it was obviously very poor production that day but it could have been worse. It could have been zero, right? We got 0.8 kilowatt hours throughout the day. November 15th through the 22nd I did an experiment and found that this was a perfect period of time that was sunny days and I just left the mini split on continuously set to 50 degrees Fahrenheit and the temperatures in the nighttime were around 20 degrees Fahrenheit and I did not touch the system for 11 days. The solar produced everything, the inverters stayed on, the mini split stayed on, and the battery percentage just bounced around in the middle range of the battery. If you're interested in perusing the data here in my Victron monitoring portal yourself, I will put a link in the video description down below to my guest portal where you have just read-only access. And you know, if in the future, for whatever reason, I decide not to show this anymore, I will remove the link from the description and I'll put a, a note in there that I've removed it. Otherwise, you're welcome to go looking through it and see what other details you can glean from it. Feel free to post in the comments below other insights that you discover. I hope this has been helpful to see my system and, and what it was capable of producing in the last year. Uh, obviously the numbers would vary depending on life happening, right? If we camped more, the battery would probably have gotten fuller more often. Uh, we did camp about a month's worth of time over the course of that year, so that's reflected in there. We you know, had times where the battery got full because we were camping and th there was nowhere for the energy to go. Anytime we were at home though, I tried really hard and generally mostly succeeded at keeping the battery from getting full because I was able to discharge it into the Tesla most of the time. I'm going to be making two more additional videos going into more detail around the charging of the Tesla from the trailer as well as the dynamic of heating and cooling the trailer from with the mini split to keep the batteries at the right temperature. So if you're interested in seeing those videos, feel free to subscribe to my channel and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.